Hi there, thank you for joining me. Welcome to Mr. Wiley's class. We're looking at uh, geographical science. Uh, at the moment, we're really looking at climate science and the evidence for climate change. But before we get into the specifics of uh, the evidence for this, this change of our climate over time, uh, we really need to understand what it is that we're looking for and how it's actually being measured. So the importance of this, the science itself rather than just what the numbers look like at the end of the day. Um, where there are a lot of people, particularly climate scientists, that might look at um, modern history and say, okay, well, sure, there's this big spike, but, you know, surely these enormous changes have been going up and down for all of the Earth's history, so why should that matter and what really do we have to do with it? Um, so we'll be taking a look at um, how we measure not just um, in the last couple of hundred years, you know, through industrialised society and, and our new methods of measuring uh, temperature, but also looking at... Um, paleoclimatology and how we go back in time essentially and look at the fingerprint of the atmosphere and the environment uh, over the last couple of thousand years, hundreds of thousand years and even millions of years. And we can look at that evidence today and use that to support our ideas of whether or not um, climate is being affected specifically by man-made actions. So as I said, what we really want to be talking about in today's lesson is not the evidence itself of climate change, but really what the evidence means and where it comes from and really what we're looking for, what we're studying. Um, so what we're talking about is studying the world's environment over time. So the atmosphere, the presence of specific gases and elements. Uh, we're looking at temperatures and different levels of rainfall and things like that. There's a lot more specifics, but really at a basic level, uh, these are some of the focuses that we're going to be looking at, particularly things like, of course, our temperature and the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the water and things like that. So as I alluded to before, uh, we have modern measurement techniques that are very accurate, but really they've only been around for a couple of hundred years, some in the last decade or so. Um, very, very specific, very, very accurate, but how do we know what's been happening in the past? Well, we don't need a time machine um, in the same way that we could walk into a crime scene. We might not have seen uh, the murderer do it. He might have left with no witnesses, uh, but we can use all sorts of clues and, and evidence and we can stack that um, as a case uh, against against that individual. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. What is this specific evidence that we can analyze and have a look at? So first of all, I just want to break down a bit of key vocabulary for us, a key term here, paleoclimatology. Um, essentially, we're breaking up three words or combining three words, paleo, climate, and ology. So uh, you might have heard that in biology, physiology, ecology, right? Um, so you probably got a, um, a little bit of a, a hint as to what we're looking at there, and we've alluded to it already. We're combining the word paleo, which means ancient or old or older. Uh, we're looking at climate itself. Obviously, obviously, we're talking about the weather, the atmospheric conditions uh, over a long period of time. And lastly, ology, meaning the study of something, whether it's theology, biology, psychology, physiology, etc. Um, so it's the study of something. So if we reverse all those words, chuck them all together, it looks like the study of ancient climate, right? So our paleo is there, our climate's there, and our study, our ology is there. So just at our starting point, here's what we can look forward to. Here are some of the key things that we would be looking for if we wanted to examine and investigate um, climate, whether that's now or in the past, um, beyond our you know, human reaches and our, and our current uh, measuring ability because, well, we don't exist tens of thousands of years ago. But these are the things that we'd be looking for if we could or if we could examine pieces of evidence from that time. So we're looking for temperature and weather patterns in modern history. Uh, we're looking for presence of gases like carbon dioxide in particular. Um, we're looking at analysing glacial and Antarctic ice from thousands and possibly millions of years ago. And we can also look at things like prehistoric fossils. Fossils, we won't really be talking about that in today's uh, lesson. So a really obvious one is, okay, we think, well, what can modern humans do? What have we actually recorded in terms of our climate? Well, the most obvious one is, of course, our temperature. Um, now, in England, we've had a very constant record of temperature since about 1659. Um, every day since then has had effectively uh, the climate reported from all around the country, or at least from specific points, and increasingly from more points. Uh, whereas a global attempt to keep records all at the same time and combine those annually and keep a massive international record, that's been going on for at least 150 years now plus. Um, so there is an enormous international effort to make sure that we're collecting all of this evidence. And 
that wasn't necessarily to develop ideas of climate change. It's really just to map and collect data of what the Earth was doing and what our atmosphere looks like. Um, and we began to notice these changes, but maybe I'm getting ahead of myself there. As you can see in this graph here, we do have global temperatures slowly rising. And you can see on this graph here, uh, lots of different organizations independent from one another, um, making all of these measurements and finding on average this global change um, in temperature. Um, but again, today we're not looking at uh, the evidence of climate change. We're simply looking at evidence of climate and what that means. But essentially, uh, our modern temperature records are a really reliable source for that. And of course, we're not only measuring atmospheric temperature, so holding a thermometer in the air or sending up weather balloons and things like that. We're also measuring um, temperature of the, the sea and we're also temp uh, measuring temperature of different elevations because you don't always want it from the exact same spot. Um, you want a lot of diversity to track those changes in all these different places at all these different heights and through all these different, um, I guess, media, for example, our seawater. One of the other really obvious and very helpful things that we can measure is our changes to ice. Um, all across the world, we have different formations of ice that have been there, some for hundreds of years, some for thousands, some for millions of years. Um, so these ice forms can be measured in a few different ways. It can be through the thinness or thickness of the ice. It can be through... Uh, whether they are breaking away or staying formed, whether they're melting and running off as water, um, and how they might be receding into the landforms um, themselves. So we can measure this in the Antarctic or the Arctic um, on our poles. We could look at uh, glaciers all around the world or even ice sheets if we're looking at, for example, the north of Russia. So all places where we can measure ice that's been there for quite a while, we can monitor what changes are happening, particularly things that we've been monitoring for the last couple of hundred years. We can see what's happening to that ice, um, but at the same time, we can also track ice that we know has been there for millions or hundreds of thousands of years um, based on the dating and measurements that we can do to them. Um, so watching those changes um, can also give us plenty of really helpful and accurate evidence about changes that are going on within uh, not only the ice itself, but at different times, what the atmosphere must have been like based on the presence of certain things in the ice. So one of the most common ways that we measure a change in climate uh, is carbon dioxide. So you've probably heard of this big bad boy, particularly when it's raised in terms of climate change, global warming, or environmental studies at all. Uh, it's, it's really the biggest indicator of a changing climate and particularly changing temperatures, uh, mainly because of the greenhouse effect. So if you've done any science in primary school or early high school, you probably understand that the greenhouse effect simply means that uh, constantly the sun is always radiating down its heat and its light energy down to Earth. Um, it enters our atmosphere, but the CO2 molecules, our carbon dioxide, can also um, absorb or track or reflect that, uh, that light and that energy so that um, when it's trying to bounce back off of the uh, Earth's surface, it's not able to escape. So the heat's entering our atmosphere, but not really being able to leave as effectively as it's coming in. So effectively, if your CO2 levels are too high, your planet will slowly, or your atmosphere will slowly start to warm. So if hypothetically there is too much CO2 in the atmosphere, that's what you would see. You would in, That's an indication of those rising temperatures. Um, we can measure this pretty simply. We can measure it atmospherically. We can chuck up a tube and we know that infrared, so a certain... Um, a certain wavelength of, of light um, that's not quite um, not quite as visible or bright or high energy as, uh, as normal light that you might see uh, coming from the sun. This uh, is absorbed by our carbon dioxide molecules or even reflected back. Uh, so just in the same as our greenhouse effect. So we can shoot our infrared, as you can see in this graphic down the bottom, shoot our infrared light straight through the tube and the less of that light that makes it to the other side, to that optical sensor or that filter, um, that means the more CO2 there must be sucking up that those light, um, those light beams and that light energy or reflecting it back. So the higher level of CO2 um, will be able to be measured by infrared. And again, we can measure modern carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We could measure it right now. We could, we've been measuring it for the last couple of decades very, very accurately. Um, however, you might be wondering, well, how do we measure what the carbon dioxide atmosphere was like 
um, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, possibly millions of years ago. Well, a really fantastic resource we have, again, as I was saying before, is our ice. Um, some of our ice forms have been there for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, and they form over an enormous period of time. Uh, so just like our trees, our rocks, our onions, as uh, I think Donkey from Shrek would say, or cakes, um, ice has layers, um, just like our earth as well. So we can measure um, not only the age of certain strata or levels of ice, but we can also see within them what the atmosphere must have been like at the time that that snow and that water settled and froze because of the different ingredients that are inside it at the time. Uh, so it can tell us a lot about the environment and particularly what we're looking for is the presence of carbon dioxide. So this strong presence of carbon dioxide bubbles inside the ice when the snow has landed and compacted those bubbles down there. Uh, we know that there must have been a strong or a high uh, level of carbon dioxide in that atmosphere. So we can measure that relative over time and track those changes. Um, you know, so you might see every 10,000 years or every 100,000 years, these rise and falls of CO2 uh, measurements. Um, so again, we're not talking about what the evidence indicates just yet. We're just looking at what uh, the type of evidence is and what we're looking for and um, how it's actually measured. So as you can see here, we can drill very, very deep into um, not only our earth, but we can drill deep, deep down into our ice and create enormous ice cores. So as you can see, there's a couple of examples here of very short ones that they can hold in their hand. Um, but these are just short segments of what they would be drilling up. Some could even go to, you know, thousands of, um, thousands of meters deep. Uh, so they take each of those sections, mark them very, very carefully to make sure that they know and they're building up a daisy chain of where this fits in the big scheme of things um, in our different layers. And they study every single teeny tiny layer and the concentrations of different gases, particularly carbon dioxide. And that will indicate over time uh, what the temperatures must have been like and what the um, carbon dioxide con concentration must have been like as well. So we can measure the carbon dioxide content in our ice, but how can we really tell the temperature of the ice, or at least the temperature of the environment of that ice at the time? Um, even though our CO2 uh, indicates that it, it will cause higher temperatures, um, we can't actually measure the temperature just based on the CO2 itself. Uh, what we can do, however, is have a look at the water itself that's stored inside or making up that ice um, on these different layers. So really quickly, I'm gonna give you a quick chemistry lesson. Um, you probably already know some of the basics. You've got H2O, H2O is water. So we've got two hydrogen uh, atoms and one oxygen atom combined to make a water molecule. Um, and if you've done any chemistry at, I guess, a year eight to nine or 10 level, you're probably familiar with the idea that um, different atoms have different levels of numbers of protons and neutrons and that sort of thing. Um, What's interesting about hydrogen is you've probably been taught at a basic level that hydrogen has one proton um, and maybe a neutron, but maybe not. If it has a mass number of one, it just has a proton, no neutrons. Um, however, what you'll find is there actually are three different types of hydrogen atom or isotopes. So they're the same atom with different weights or different ingredients inside them, uh, but it's still hydrogen because it's still got the one proton. Quick chemistry lesson. Um, as you can see here from this example, our, our protium has no neutrons, but our one proton. Our uh, deuterium has one neutron and our tritium, so our three, because um, it makes up a mass of three with our one proton and two neutrons. Uh, essentially, all this means is we have a hydrogen atom, but some of them are heavier than others, as you can see here. They've got more bits in them, so they're gonna be slightly heavier. Essentially, what this means is that uh, if you have a water molecule, uh, one of those hydrogen atoms in there, because we've got two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, one of those hydrogen atoms could be a heavier um, isotope. So it could be our deuterium, it could be our uh, tritium. Now, what this essentially means is that we can have water and then we can have heavy water if it's made up um, of more of these heavy hydrogen atoms. Um, the trick is, and what, you might be wondering, what's this got to do with climate? What's this got to do with temperature? The trick is the only way for these higher or these heavy water, um, these heavier water molecules 
to evaporate and rise up into the sky and freeze and become snow and drop down is for them to heat up, of course, and evaporate. But it takes more heat for our heavy ones, our heavy water, uh, to evaporate than it does for our normal water. So we can see relative that if there's a higher concentration of these bigger hydrogen atoms in this ice and this heavy water, we know that at the time that that must have fallen, that must have been hotter for it to have evaporated that heavy water into the sky to become snow and land and compact and become ice. Um, so in quick summary, uh, the more of this heavy hydrogen and this heavy water that we find in layers of ice, and we can measure that um, through all sorts of processes, um, stoichiometry um, and all these sort of complex things that we won't talk about here, but we can measure the levels of these different uh, amounts of hydrogen. Um, so the higher the amount of heavy hydrogen or heavy water, the hotter we know that that environment must have been like. So we can actually measure temperature hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, at least relative to one another. So we might not be able to say exactly what the number might be to seven decimal places, uh, but we can show changes in those temperatures over time and put an average of those temperatures and come up with a reasonable number and calculate that. So in conclusion, we've looked at a couple of sources of evidence and a couple of things that we might be looking for to analyze and study our climate. Uh, we've looked at temperature, we've looked at the presence of different types of gases, uh, including both our uh, carbon dioxide, but also our heavy hydrogen within our water or ice molecules. Um, we're not only looking at modern figures and temperatures and measurements, we can also, as you know now, measure things like our ice that have existed for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Um, so we can do a lot of forensic work and, you know, arrest that murderer, even though we never saw him do it, all the clues point towards it. So right now we're not exactly looking at what the evidence concludes, but we, at least from today's lesson, you can know that we can trust the evidence. It's incredibly accurate. We have an entire international community of independent organizations coming up with their results. So if we add those all together, and combine them and compare those results, what we come up with should be pretty accurate. If not, it would just be a mumble jumble of all this different data. But if they're all sort of agreeing on the same thing, we should be able to follow that evidence where it leads. But we might be getting ahead of ourselves. I'll see you for the next lesson where we actually analyze the evidence itself for climate change. All right, all the best. Bye.